So what's happening in all of these pictures? Okay. Might be more obvious in the pictures of the birds right here and the mm, those what are those animals? So then I don't know what they are. <laughs> Teacher fail. Um, but two males competing for mates, two birds competing for food, and right here we have our trees competing for things like sunlight and water. So what we're talking about right now is competition. It's a very important interaction between organisms in an ecosystem um, up there with all of the symbiotic relationships, up there with predator-prey relationships. So we can have competition um, between members of the same species as we can see here and here and then even, you know, plants compete, different types of trees are competing for sunlight and trees of the same species are competing for sunlight as well. Um, competition for, um, so competing for limiting factors within an ecosystem, both abiotic, non-living, and biotic living, is a really important thing that happens, but species like to avoid competition, so that's what we're going to talk about now. In order to understand competition and how species avoid that, you need to understand what a niche is, or a niche, or a niche, there are a lot of different ways you can say it. They're all correct. Um, and this is an organism's role in, a, in an ecosystem. And some organisms have a very broad role. Think about like a field mouse. It can live in all sorts of different places. It can eat all sorts of different foods. Other organisms have what's called a very specialized niche, which means, um, well, for example, a koala only eats eucalyptus leaves. So it can only live successfully in the wild in Australia, where there are eucalyptus plants. And if something were to happen to the eucalyptus, that would be a problem. So anyway, back to how um, a niche is related to competition. When two organisms have a niche that overlaps, okay, that can be seen here. Okay. So if we're thinking about types of food, for example, and organism A in red can eat all sorts of these different types of foods, and organism B can eat these types of foods. Well, what happens is in the overlap here, they would be competing for those resources. And animals and species, plants, like to avoid competition because competition uses energy. So what happens is we end up with a principle that's called competitive exclusion. And we'll look at a couple of examples of these in just a moment. Um, but basically, they avoid that overlap area right there to eliminate the competition. And oftentimes, one species wins over the other one. So let's look at that. All right, so first example we'll look at. This is a laboratory experiment. And they did is they were growing different types of paramecium. Paramecium, remember, are unicellular um, eukaryotic organisms. They're protists, um, kind of animal-like, so they're protozoan. And they were just growing two different species. So when they grew this species all by itself, okay, we can see this logistic growth. So they had exponential growth, and then once they kind of topped off on the resources in terms of space and food, it leveled out. And then when they grew a second species all by itself, we see the same growth pattern. When the two species were grown together, okay, so now there's competition. They're competing for things like um, the nutrients they need, the space, etc. You can see that the Paramecium aurelia, the blue line, okay, they both started to grow right here, but then the Paramecium aurelia won. Okay, um, so their population continued to grow, whereas the Paramecium caudatum population, it dwindled. Okay, competitive exclusion, because those two species share the exact same niche. So it's not going to work. Over here, we have a real-life example looking at barnacles in the intertidal zone. So that's the area between um, the high tide mark and the low tide mark. So what researchers have done is they re moved all the different types of barnacles except for one species. And 
so that one species right here, okay, when it was all by itself, lived within this blue arrow over here represents the um, right here represents the intertidal zone, so it could live in that whole entire intertidal zone. When a second species was introduced, okay, shown in blue, but they're not actually different colors like that, um, we can see that that first species now only lives in the upper part of the intertidal zone. And the blue species, if we can call it that, lives in the lower part of the intertidal zone. Okay, So again, competitive exclusion, separating their niches out so there isn't competition. And in real life, if we're not even looking at you know, scientists manipulating nature, if you will, um, different types of warblers. Okay, so they're all different species, the Cape May, bay-breasted, myrtle, black Burnian, the black-throated green warbler, all different types of warblers. So they're similar, they would share a recent common ancestor for thinking about evolution, but they are different species. They cannot successfully reproduce with one another. Um, they will all live in different parts of a tree. Okay, so we really see some niche diversity. Okay. And why? because this way they're avoiding competition. They all have their own separate nesting sites. They can you know, eat bugs in different parts of the tree, etc. So that's something that species will do to avoid competition and to save energy.